yeah, it's easy when you look at the conquest to say, oh, if they're not even human, then of course, yeah, slaughter the the men, women, and children. They're not human. Um, and I had several guests on my show promoting this idea that the Antichrist would himself be a hybrid and that the mark would would be taking some of that DNA to upgrade um, your DNA uh, so that you could live forever or whatever. And at that point now you're unredeemable and you're no longer human um, be, and you're unredeemable because you're not human. And and that was something that's being taught, like I said, by, by multiple people, you know, it, it, it makes for a compelling story, I suppose. And those are the things that sort of itched my ears for a while, but you know, I just don't, um, I just don't think it is in, in the Bible. And so I put a, Welcome back to Curious Christianity. If you've ever thought about the Nephilim and the giants and the interesting subject of was it angels coming down to earth and being with women, then today's show is for you. I have special guest, Sam Delgado, and he has written a book about the Sethite view. It was a particular view of Genesis 6. And he is here to try and bring some clarity to the issue. As this issue has been blown up way more because of Michael Heiser and other theologians, I think it's really important that we do take a close look at this subject and that we don't lead other people into frivolous pursuits or things that the Bible is not saying. So with all of that, Sam, welcome to the channel. Thanks for having me on uh, and for the wonderful intro. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and so I understand that you actually have a podcast and a show. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about why you started that and how that all came to be? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I think I started in 2021, in March of 2021. And uh, prior to starting the podcast, um, I was... The the podcast itself is, is took me on, on a real... Un expected journey um i didn't really have like a an end goal in mind when i started it but i really think the lord just used it um to mature me uh when i started the podcast um a couple of the topics that i i knew i wanted to hit on were end times and then i'll just say the weird things like we're going to be talking about today uh including the nephilim and so the podcast itself is called Weird Christian Podcast, not because I myself am a Christian who's weird, but I'm a Christian who's covering weird content. Uh, so that's kind of the idea behind the the podcast. And at, you know, when I started it, it was really uh, just piggybacking off a lot of the stuff that I was reading, um, which I now would not see as like good scholarship. Um, but I was obsessed with with end times and with you know Nephilim and, and anything weird. And so it, it wasn't until I kind of got into the podcast and uh, started interviewing uh, lots of different people on lots of different topics that I was sort of disillusioned by the weird. And um, during that time, I became a, a Bible teacher. Uh, it seems like every topic I would cover, I would just like dive further into the topic. I kind of thought I knew a lot about end times starting the, the podcast and about Nephilim, but then I read even more after doing the interviews. And, um, and so in a lot of ways, uh, I, I did change my view on Nephilim and on end times. And, uh, it's been a, a real, a real blessing. I, I've kind of walked away out of it, um, with a, a deeper understanding of how to read the Bible. And I realized kind of when I started the podcast that I didn't really, uh, I didn't really know how to do that at the time. I was like, for example, you mentioned Michael Heiser. I would read uh, his books and I would just, devour them and if i had a question about something that i was reading i would just go back to michael heiser listen to a podcast and try to get what he understands about it and i would kind of take that as the scholar and as the authority um whereas now i feel like i have a little bit um a better understanding of how to read the bible and understand it um for myself where i have some tools where i can actually you know, I, I obviously still consult like 
commentaries and things like that, but um, I'm not as uh, reliant on, you know, someone else's views. So the Nephilim was definitely very unexpected. When I started the podcast, I was at the opposite view that I currently have, uh, very much so. And I would have, like, argued against the Sethite view um, adamantly, you know, uh, vehemently. Um, and, uh, and so here I am, <laughs> written a book about it. And as you mentioned, it's, it's underrepresented, uh, which is why I wrote the book. I actually was looking for a guest for my podcast that could talk about the Sethite view. And I found one guest, and he backed out at the last minute because he didn't really feel like he was, you know, an expert in that particular topic. And so I finally was like, well, I'll just, I think I did find a guest who, who sort, we sort of covered it. And then I felt like I needed to really do a full episode uh, myself. And the, the response from that particular episode on my podcast, it's called why I changed my view on the Nephilim uh, was the biggest I had ever gotten. Um, and, there was so much commentary, you know, of course, half of it was, you know, great. Thank you so much. Half of it was like people disagreeing with me. And, uh, so I felt like it was something I just needed to, uh, write the book about to answer all the questions that I didn't in that particular, uh, podcast episode. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, it's a little background about me. I'm, I'm, a, I teach Bible at the high school level at a public school, which is a, a unique thing. And, uh, yeah, my, my podcast covers, I'm not as active with it anymore. And in fact, I, I took some of the weird stuff off because a lot of the interviews that I did, I just thought I, I no longer believe this and I don't want to um, promote a, a view that I feel like is false. So, uh, but there's still a, a ton of episodes on there that I'm, I'm uh, real proud of. And, and uh, anyway, thank you for having me on. Nephilim and End Times are something I can talk about all day so um well yeah we, we we might talk more about the end time stuff too then um cool. so because i'm actually going to be doing some debates coming up and one of them i'll be debating on the end times um and uh, a bunch of other stuff and so yeah i i really hope that yeah you'll be open for a pretty open discussion so yeah. i really liked uh, a bunch of your writing and thinking on this and personally i i have probably a, a few nuances. And so mm -hmm. I'm actually really curious to continue to work through this. Uh, one, because I do disagree with Michael Heiser on some of this. Um, so I, I think that this will be really interesting. And yeah, li like you mentioned, like, yeah, it's pretty underrepresented, the Seth I view. Um, and now for most people, they won't actually even know um, so in a, in a second, I want to talk a little bit about like, okay, what are some of the views on Genesis six? Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I, as well, uh, actually, I couldn't really find too many other people to even defend the Seth I view either. Yeah. Uh, but even I had, I had one friend who, uh, basically espoused it. And to be honest, uh, all I did was read second Peter and, uh, he was like, okay, I don't feel so confident about it at all. Like, I mean, I'm not even joking. Like yeah. it really yeah. wasn't much more than that. And he's like, well, mm -hmm. let me, maybe I need to rethink this. So um, I think that there's, there's a lot of a really good thinking and stuff in your book. And so uh, to be honest, I really do it. It is probably one of the better pieces that I've, I've read on, um, on the subject. So I, I just want to say super kudos to you. For having completed the book on that. Um, I'm trying mm -hmm. to, I'm working on a book right now. And so the amount of work and effort it takes just to complete a book is really, really hard in my opinion. So yeah. congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This one was like, I pretty much had the whole thing outlined after I did that because I already had a rough outline that I did for my podcast episode. And that just basically became the book. Um, I kind of added a, a couple of chapters um, you know, pieces to the outline, but I wrote this book quick. I mean, it, it just, it came out of me and I could not stop writing it. It was one of these things where I felt like I'd done 10 years of research because I've, I've read a lot of books, uh, um, on the <laughs> Nephilim and I've interviewed people who have written those books. And, uh, so it was, it was a topic that I knew a lot about and I've listened to countless of 
you know, podcast. It, it was something when it came time to write it, it just, it just kind of came out of me. That's thank awesome. You. Well, the other thing that I really appreciate about you is that I feel like you are really truth oriented and you're willing to, to move the needle uh, based on where you feel like the evidence is aligning and where the Bible is aligning. And, and I think that's so important and so crucial today. And so for example, I, I've been doing, I've done a bunch of work on Satan and stuff like that. So concerning all of the Bible verses talking about Satan, like I have a bunch of information and knowledge. And so that was getting around to some of my friends and they're like, Oh, I want to talk to you about this. And then what did they really want to talk about? Aliens. Right. And I was like, yeah. uh, like, like, what is there? Like I had one dude in, he, he asked, he's like, he went on this long rant and I said, okay, cool. So like, where does that find its basis in scripture? And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Like he's just, and he just rambled on, rambled on, rambled on. And I was like, so where does that find its basis in scripture? Mm -hmm. And he had no answer. There was nothing. Right. right. And I was like, okay, like, yeah, sure. You could speculate, but I'm here to talk about the Bible. And you have absolutely nothing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I found, um, through doing the podcast that I have, I was kind of moving further and further out from truth. If I could find one door, like for the aliens, you know, you could sort of just say, well, fallen angels, demons, Boom, and then there's kind of endless speculation from there as long as you have some something to anchor it with. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that alien topic is one where there's endless speculation um, and very little to ground it um, in scripture. Yeah. So if you could lay out for us a few of the different views that dominate Genesis six and what are we talking about concerning the Nephilim and what's really at hand here? Sure. I've heard up to like four, uh, but there's really only two that um, are popular and that people hold to. Um, you know, the, the one I argue against in the book is what I d deem the angelic view, which is that in Genesis six, the sons of God are angels uh, that procreate with the daughters of men, which are humans. Um, and then the result are giants uh, that are referred to as Nephilim. Uh, so that'd be one view. Uh, the Sethite view is that the sons of God are the sons or descendants of Seth. And so we have the daughters of men, which are the descendants of Cain. And we have basically a righteous and an unrighteous line um, that result in the, the Nephilim. And that would just be, um, basically the, the corruption of Seth's godly line, uh, just by intermarrying with an, uh, with an ungodly line. That's what I argue in, in the book. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a couple other views. One is, I think the, the royal view that we have the sons of gods that are kings uh royalty they're taking women um for themselves uh and i think there's there's another uh, variant of that and it's not too different from that but i don't deal with i only deal with those two um just the angelic view and the sethite view in the book and i think those are those are the only two that i actually know that people hold i don't think the other two are very popular yeah so what do you feel like is at stake? Yeah, you know, ultimately, this is a, it's not like a, a top tier issue. You know, it's not a, a part of like essential uh, core Christian doctrine. So for me personally, I opened the book with my, the preface, giving a personal antidote of how this has affected my life personally. And not everyone's going to have that experience. But my experience was that I, grew obsessive and the Nephilim was kind of an open door into a lot of other weird aspects and probably false teachings um, that I probably would not have been exposed to. A aliens would be an example of that had it not been for the Nephilim. And so um, 
for me, it was unhealthy uh, obsession. Whereas like I would obsess with all this weird stuff um, and including end times to the point where I would spend more time consumed in that, in the speculation than just the, the word of God. And it really wasn't until I, what kind of drew me out of the angelic view was a larger perspective of uh, the Bible as a whole. And what had I not heard argued before was the Sethi view in terms of not just Genesis 6, um, but the the entire Bible, the theme of, of intermarriage. And so that's when it sort of, there's always points of, of the angelic view that um, didn't quite stick with me. There are parts that I'm like, yeah, I, I get it. And, 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 I would argue from those points and I would kind of anchor myself in, in those points. So for example, uh, the flood and the conquest were, were, were two things that I thought, okay, we have a, a justification for the end of the human race with the flood uh, and a justification for um, those that are doomed for destruction with the conquest. Um, and that fit my sensibilities um, better than simply we have not hybrid beings, but humans that are sinful. And um, so part of it for me also was, was just taking the Bible um, at its word for, for, for what it says, you know, and, and I had to look at the Genesis narrative and look at it starting with Adam, moving all the way to Noah and what I saw was a story about the fall of humanity, not the, and it didn't involve angels at all. And so that's when it was, I started to think, okay, this makes sense. And I could argue this so much easier than the angelic view, because the angelic view, as I try to point out in my book, has gaping holes. And in one of those that you'll see a lot of scholars argue back and forth about is how we have Nephilim after the flood. And so that's one that I, tried to expose that everyone has their different theories about that. And none of them, none of them work. I don't know yeah, where, so you, I'm where you started with the question, but anyway. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's great. That's a, definitely a great uh, way to get into everything. And because, so for myself, I, I have some certain tensions here and um, I'm really curious to kind of work some of these out with you uh, because some of, some of them are a little bit in process for me. Um, but I, I'm not entirely sure how to solve some of the problems. But you, you're articulating a, a good view that I think, I think really helps in some areas. So let me let me give you an example. Like you, you listed this this problem of like the conquest and the flood, right? And so mm -hmm. the postulation by Heiser and some others is this idea that part of the point of the flood and the conquest of Canaan is to wipe out this impure bloodline of these hybrid creatures. Is that right? Right. Yeah. That's how I understood it. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what I, I feel like. And I, I found this to be rather shocking to be honest. So for example, Michael Heiser takes like the image of God to be the idea that mankind is God's representatives, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's talking about this notion that we're God's representatives, but then there's this new focus on the bloodline and that it has something to do with our biology that matters. Mm -hmm. And I just don't find that to be that reasonable really at all. And I do actually find this to be incredibly potentially problematic moving forward uh, because how, how does this not fold into the possibility of Christians promoting genocide? It's, it's really sticky. Um, I, I hate, well, whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll call out uh, Dr. Laura Sanger was someone I had on my show twice. She's written a book um, that I thought was potentially dangerous in this respect because you get into this area where if the bloodline has been tainted, then that's gone down to our bloodlines and you know she's promoting this idea that there is um still hybrid dna 
that's dormant within people today that could become active and as a result someone with this who's carrying these genes would be more prone to violence for example um even going as far to saying that you know someone with red hair might be more likely to carry this gene than someone who who's not and so that bothers me a little bit because now like exactly like you said we're getting into this area where how do you distinguish um you know who could be affected by their biology and and who's not and you sort of create a second tier uh of christian uh, or, or even human at that point which is yeah potentially dangerous yeah and so like you're talking about these other people who are following these lines and i've seen the posts on twitter i've seen the post on twitter is they're thinking about like okay for example oh i hate to i'm not going to go there i would have skipped that one but for example, they're talking about the ideas of AI changing, mutating human DNA or making these alterations. And this is what some Christians are looking at as the mark of the beast. And they are right. saying like, they're no longer human. Right. Yep. And so that gives them the potential justification for Christians to promote genocide and murders of many people because they have different bloodlines and they yeah. go back and appeal to Genesis six for this. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy when you look at the conquest to say, Oh, if they're not even human, then of course, yeah. Slaughter the, the men, women, and children. They're not human. Um, and I had several guests on my show promoting this idea that the antichrist would himself be a hybrid and that the mark would, would be taking some of that DNA to upgrade um, your DNA uh, so that you could live forever or whatever. And at that point now you're unredeemable and you're no longer human um, be, and you're unredeemable because you're not human. And and that was something that's being taught, like I said, by, by multiple people, you know, it, it, it makes for a compelling story, I suppose. And those are the things that sort of itched my ears for a while, but you know, I just don't, um, I just don't, think it is in in the bible and so i put a huge focus on my on my book on on enoch because that is the open door i think to this view because it's taught explicitly in in enoch and so if 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 we can just tether ourselves to that and heiser is really big on enoch because i think without enoch we don't really have the justification um to promote this view because it's just not in the the Genesis narrative at all. It's just not there. Um, you have to impose it on, on the narrative. Um, and that's the justification is Enoch. Yeah. So this is the part where, like I was saying that, that I feel like it was a huge tragedy that Heiser did talking about uh, man being appointed, right. As like God's image, his representative. And then, because that is a very non-biological aspect. Yeah. And I think a lot like you're articulating the sin is what was important, that the wickedness is what, what mattered. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm very concerned about this issue is because there is this aspect of wickedness and that's what needs to be addressed. And the part that I found completely shocking hearing about Michael Heiser's view was that he was talking about David, if I remember correctly, and that David has some sort of aspect of like cleansing the line or something like that. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Are, are we talking about biology? Are we talking about righteousness and how you live your life? Like these are different things. And it's mm -hmm. very important that we're being clear as to what's happening. Yeah. So I really yeah. want a second. Yeah. These, these notion that you're pushing back on the, on the, the hybrid view in a sense. Yeah. And I even, um, you know, what sort of, again, anchored me in the Sethite view or the just explicit verses, uh, about the conquest. Um, and you can say the same thing for the flood, but the conquest was one where, again, I like the teaching 
that Heiser was promoting because of my sensibilities about the destruction of, of men, women, and children. But when you look at what scripture is actually saying, it explicitly says multiple times, um, you know, for example, this is Abraham, uh, Genesis chapter 15, uh, where he, uh, the Lord tells Abraham that his descendants would be slaves. Uh, he's going to die after four generations. They'll come back into the land because the sins of the Am Amorites is not yet warrant their destruction. Um, I've heard that sort of explained away by John Walton on 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 my uh, podcast, and there's a lot of gymnastics there. But what kind of just it's just so clear. And then it says the same thing in Deuteronomy that it's it's their their sin, like over and over and over again. It says that there are to destroy them because of their idolatry. Um, that he's trying to protect his people against that same idolatry, and it just couldn't be more clear. And at no point is there ever even a hint that there's something hybridized about the people. So again, it this became such an easy position for me to defend, especially looking at the flood. The whole thing is about humans. They never had mention of an angel. So it, it's like, okay, maybe it just says what it says. Maybe this is about the wickedness of man, just like it says over and over and over again. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the more specifics. So, uh, for example, real quick, let me just read Genesis uh, 6 1, just so people have a little bit of that context of what's going on, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Genesis 6 1 says, Now it happened when men or when men began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were good in appearance and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And that's, that's it. That's what the big controversy is about in essence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So in essence, one of the big views is when it says the sons of God, some people take that to be referring to angels, angelic beings. And they get this from the book of Job, right? When the sons mm -hmm. of God met. So this gets into the idea of the divine council and these notions that these must be angels coming down. And now, so your view has to do with simply following, okay, this is going with the godly line. And so that's what it means by the sons of God. Is that right? That's right. And if you look at the context of Genesis, Adam is the son of God. It says explicitly those that exact phrase for Adam. And if you look at the genealogy for Adam, starting with Seth, it opens with him being a son of God and then goes straight to, to Seth. So we have the, the sons of God. If we're looking at the context to interpret sons of God, we need to stay right there in Genesis. We don't need to go to, to, to Job. That's what I argue in my book. And in fact, if you get a concordance, sons of God means is referring to humans more than it is ever referring to angels. And, you know, I, th I think it's actually only there in Job, but that's like, again, that's the, all you need is that one little, uh, verse cross reference to say there you go this is how we interpret it but let's just stick with what genesis says and we get a very clear picture heading into genesis 6 with the fall of humanity in chapter 3 we see cain is removed from the land and he starts his own city and they're violent at the end of his line we see and in fact cain is referred to as a man um whereas uh, Seth is referred to as a son. It's the same language we have when we get to Genesis 6. Sons of God, daughters of men. Um, and when we get to Lamech at the end of Cain's line, he is singing a song bragging about murdering a man. So we have right there what is said of the Nephilim. They're mighty men of renown. They're violent. And that's exactly what results uh, from this uh, mixing uh, of the sons of God and the daughters of men. We have violence. So we don't need to go anywhere but the context of Genesis to see where does this violence come from. It comes from Cain. He's the murderer, and so are his descendants. They're violent people. Um, so, and even if we look at the genealogy, it's it's the context behind six. If it comes in, in, in five, 
uh, we have the mention of uh, Adam being made in the image of God. We have the mention of him being a son of God. We have the mention of Enoch, who is righteous, who walked with the Lord and is taken. And then we have the mention of Noah that's going to give his people rest. So we have a very clear contrast between the line of Cain, where we have murder and violence, and the the line of Seth, which are righteous. So when we get to Genesis 6, naturally, we read it to mean sons of God are the righteous line, and the daughters of men are the unrighteous line. Where does this concept of angel come from? It comes from Job. That's it. That's that's the only justification. But where do we have angels before or after? They're not there. They're not there. And so that's why I, I would just say it just makes a lot more sense to interpret uh, sons of God within the context of Genesis. Um, but even, if, again, if you want to cross-reference, if you want to argue that, you can't ignore all the other references where sons of God is referring to to man. Because, uh, again, it refers to, to man more than it does angels. Yeah, so th those are, like, I think really, really good postulations and arguments. So this is where I'm getting a little bit caught up. It really has to do with the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So if it was not for the New Testament, I think I would just buy your explanation virtually wholesale. Right. Now, I know you, you give some arguments in the book concerning some of these passages, but this is where I definitely want to talk through some of these parts. Yeah. Because all of this is where we really get into trying to dive a little deeper. So let's start with uh, 1 Peter 3. How's that? These are where you start to get into these bigger explanations about Nephilim and everyone thinking about like, oh, this is definitely Nephilim, especially after Heiser. Heiser is the one who has really popularized yes. so much of this work and really yes. changed the, the landscape. Absolutely. And many more people who used to be holding on to the Sethite view, they were now shifting back and they're like, yeah, now I'm starting to feel the, yeah. they're feeling the weight of, of Michael sure. Heiser. And absolutely. And there's, there's definitely practically a little Heiserite cult going on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. So what, what do you think of uh first Peter three 18? Uh, would you like me to read it or please? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So for Christ also suffered for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous. So that he might bring to you God having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit in which he also made and pro uh, made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons were brought safely through the water corresponding to that baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal of good conscience to God through the resurrection of Christ, who is the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Right. Um, so your question is just yeah, my, so, my commentary on that? Yeah, a little bit of commentary. So this is where everyone believes and, and would argue that right Christ is going down to give proclamation to the fallen angels of Genesis 6. And so I believe kind of your argument that I saw in the book was the idea is like, no, no, this is contrasting human spirits because it's talking about like these spirits who are in prison, but then it's also what contrasted with the eight who got on the, on the boat. So those mm -hmm. who are saved. Yeah. So how do we make sense of this in your view? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does say, right. He, which also went and preached unto the spirits in heaven or I'm sorry, the spirits in, in prison. So if you impose the, angelic view on here, you could certainly say that these spirits are angelic spirits. Um, but the text does not say that, right? It just says spirits. Um, so there's really, there's no reason um, to, to take these as angelic. Uh, the following verse, uh, again, which sometime we're disobedient, 
when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So we have these these spirits again being contrasted with with human spirits. So I think there's a lot more reason to believe that these are humans. Um, but again, we take that's that's the, the difference between eisegesis and exegesis, right? You look at the context, you let the, the text um interpret itself, but if you impose a view upon the text, sure, you can throw in angels here, but um, there's no reason, I just don't see any reason uh, for this to be angelic in, in nature. You know, I just so this is the part where, I, this is the part where I want to push back a little bit, because mm -hmm. the part that I haven't found the connection with your view is, mm -hmm. why is Jesus speaking to these spirits then? Now, is it your view that Jesus is speaking to the spirits that were dead during the times of Noah? Or is it your view that Jesus went back and preached to them? Or I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what your view is on what Jesus is doing and who he's doing it to and why. Yeah. Jesus is, is, is king and he is conquered death and he's proclaiming that uh, to, to the dead um, because he's defeated uh death he's defeated the, the the devil the curse has been lifted um so that's what he's he's going into um into hell or to the you know to sheol to to proclaim um simple simple as that uh so i mean this would this would have been something that the demons or fallen angels would have been aware of so I guess you could probably even make a further deduction that he wouldn't need to descend into hell to preach to the demons. The demons already were aware, right, when they when he was ministering on earth. Um, we see an example in Jesus' teaching where a, a human says, let me go back and in one of his parables, let me, um, the, uh, the rich man of Lazarus says, let me go back and tell my brothers. And he says, no, no, no. They got the Moses and the prophets. So we, we have, you know, what's going down uh, for, for human souls in prison um, that would need to be proclaimed. You know, they're not necessarily privy to what the, what the demons are, where their demons are, they're roaming on, on the earth, right? They're not um, confound to the prison. Um, so. So, yeah, so are you. Are you asserting that, that that there aren't any demons in prison, or? Yeah, well, I, I would say that they they would have access to the earth, whereas humans don't. What? Um, I guess I got lost. What do you mean, like humans? Yeah, humans don't have access to the earth after they die, right? Right. Yeah. But but would you hold that like there aren't any demons in prison? So like, we'll get to a couple of these other verses, which are going to further talk. So would you assert that there are no demons in prison now, or that there are some fallen angels in prisons now? Yeah. Well, I think when we look at prison, um, we can't, we can't take that in, in a, in a literal sense where, where we're taking someone and, and locking them behind a cage where they, where they, where they can't go anywhere. Um, the the fallen angels angels have been judged um you know they've not been sentenced yet so that's what we see demons speaking to jesus saying you've not come here to judge us before our time right and then he mm -hmm. sends them to the, the the pigs right which then drown so um yeah i mean there is a sense where they are imprisoned um, because they're, they're fallen angels, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're locked away, um, in like a dungeon where they, they can't uh, escape. Um, I'm merely bringing that up to say that it would actually just make more sense for him have to descend to preach to humans rather than demons. Um, that was no, my, my, my only point there. My biggest struggle with the human view is like mm -hmm. the timeline. It, in other words, it's the notion that why is he speaking to the spirits in prison from the times of Noah? 
as opposed to like, it doesn't say like, and then Christ preached to the dead, like, which would just sound like it is encompassing everybody. Right. But this one goes back specifically to the times of Noah. And so that's the part that why I'm just struggling to fully get there on the human view is that it's <laughs> like, it's not, in, it doesn't sound like, or it doesn't remind me of just the blanket dead, but it reminds me of like this specific time frame. Like Peter is like locking it in a little bit. And so that's the part where I'm like, ah, I'm not quite there on the human thing with like, oh, he's proclaiming good news to the spirits. It's like, okay, but why didn't it say to the, the dead prophets or the martyrs or, you know, all the other wonderful people, you know, King David and, you know, those other ones who, who we know were the righteous saints, you know, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, like that would have been like an interesting contrast to me because if, of course, Abraham comes after this and Jesus even specifically mentions them, right. When it's talking about like who you will see in the resurrection, yeah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so if, if he had said something like, and then Christ went down and preached to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who are dead, then I would think like, okay, this is like a, depiction of proclamation for the righteous saints, but I I'm struggling to see the human connection during this timeline. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I wish I had time to look at the context here, but I think Peter is, is using the flood as an example, um, of, of judgment. That was, you know, when we look at something like the flood, it is a picture of judgment for all mankind, right? This is coming to a head with what Christ is doing with, with his ministry. Um, so I think it's not necessarily that any way you slice it, he's not only preaching to a particular group here, um, right? I mean, even if you were to take the angelic view here that he's preaching to angels, it still wouldn't make much sense for that to only be that particular group for that particular time, um, you know, without the context truly is not, um, fresh in my, in my mind, but that, that would be what I'm thinking here is that he's using Noah as an example, you know, referring to this, this long suffering, um, of God waiting, um, in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. I think he's using this, as an example for Christians that he's writing to um, during, during that time. With, with the further context, like let's, let's, let me read second Peter two a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Cause I think people are, they're kind of trying to connect the dots between yeah. second Peter two and first Peter three. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. kind of adding to the notion for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you wrote about this a little bit in your book as well. Yeah. So second Peter two, four through six, says, for God did not spare angels who sinned, but cast them into the pit and delivered them to chains of darkness, being kept for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction, reduced them to ashes, having made them an example who would live ungodly lives. Right? So, and then it goes on to like say all this other little bit of other stuff. But but in essence, it's like you would agree that it's specifically mentioning angels in chapter two of uh second Peter, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you read Jude, I think it's clear that Jude is is reading Second Peter. Um they're they're laid out um this, this the same way, and he's addressing the same topic, false teachers. Um, so with Jude in particular and, and, and also second Peter, my conclusion is he, he uses like three examples of, and he uses three different sins that he attributes to false teachers, um, so the, the church is having issues with false teachers coming in and they're confusing Christians. And so he uses examples in this particular case, particular case, angels who dis despise dominion. That was their sin. 
And so he's saying, just like these false teachers that despise dominion, they're going to be judged just like those angels were judged uh, that fell. Um, more clear in Jude because it's more concise. But Jude, I believe, gi gives three examples of, of three different groups that are judged. And then he immediately goes into the sins that correlate with each of those examples. Um, so, yes, I do think he is talking about angels um, that gave up their, that they, that fell. Um, I, I think that's, that's true. Um, you know, to go, you know, that's a, a bit of a leap, you know, to, to, to take that and then assume that what he's referring to, uh, these spirits in prison in first Peter must be angels as well. I don't see it. I, I don't, um, I don't see it, but even still, I don't necessarily think that's, I don't, I wouldn't take that to mean that we, we never in any case have a, a sin that's ever explicitly said to be angels procreating with women in, 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 in either case, even if you were to make the argument that he's preaching to, to angels. Um, in, in yeah, I think the, I think the primary connection here is the idea of the time frame. That's one of the really yeah. tough parts that I find difficult escaping is the fact that he's mentioning during the times of Noah in both selections. So that's the main thing that brings me back to the idea of Genesis six. Now I'm very sympathetic to your idea that, okay, maybe there's not any aspect of angel sleeping with women. And you actually give several other arguments you actually give several other arguments concerning like this notion. I'll say that I'm not entirely compelled by them concerning like you talk about like the idea is like, well, if it's angels, can angels really procreate with women? How are these giant sort of issues supposed to happen? And I really understand the intuition behind this notion. Like when you're talking about like, okay, well, if there's not going to be any marriage in heaven, certainly there won't be any procreation. What would it really even mean for an angel to be able to procreate or why would they have those abilities? I think those are reasonable questions for sure. And I think for the thinking individual, they have to consider those, you know, it's very worthwhile. Here's one of my big questions for you though. Concerning all of this, it's clearly talking about a fall of the angels. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I'm actually going back to Second Peter, and, and it doesn't. It, there's not a time frame for the angels, right? It's not, it doesn't place those angels within the within the. Um, well, it says uh, verse five, no, no. right? Second Peter two, verse five, right? And he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's verse four is for God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into the pit. So that seems to be the time frame is that he didn't spare the angels during the time of Noah. That's, I mean, it doesn't say that explicitly. I'm, you know, summarizing, but if you read from verse four to verse six or, or verse five. Yeah. I mean, if you know, by that line of thinking, you could, just jump down to verse six, right? And then he moves to the, the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is obviously a different time frame. So I wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. lump, I wouldn't lump four and five together as far as time goes. Gotcha. I mean, we have, we have a, you know, kind of a start of, of a new thought here with and spared not the old world, where I feel like he's now moving to a separate example. So I, I wouldn't, I would not tie those two together. And, and, and so I got uh, you. let me, let me let me go to Jude because I feel like in Jude it's it's yeah. a lot it's a lot clearer um, and this is something that these are great questions by the way because it's the it's the details um, that that will, will will keep you clinging to a, a particular view but like in Jude for example um, we have this closing sort of statement in reference to the false teachers in verse eight mm -hmm. this is likewise also these filthy 
dreamers, referring to the false teachers, defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of, of dignities. So we have three sins that are being attributed to the false teachers. So if we just look at the context that leads into this closing statement about these false teachers, we have a group that goes with each one of these sins. So often in Jude, they do the same thing where they say, oh, well, we have this 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 timeline with the flood, and we're going to match it to the same sin, sexual sin that we see happening with Sodom and Gomorrah. But if you look at the three examples, they actually align with these three different sins. So for there are certain men crept unawares who were uh, before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into viciousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and then now we have the three examples. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Uh, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believed not. So that's one example where we have uh, a group that uh, they, they speak evil uh, of dignities. And then we have the angels, which kept not their first estate. Um, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So now we have a group um, that despises dominion. And then we have, again, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, another example, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves. So I take, I take this to mean that uh, it's the cities that are in like manner, right, like Sodom and Gomorrah, not, not the previous verse about the angels, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and set forth, for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So that would be defiling the flesh that we see in verse 8. So in the same way, I think Peter's doing the same thing, where we have these false teachers, and he's saying, well, look, these false teachers are going to be judged just like these groups were judged, right? We have a group here in Sodom and Gomorrah, they defiled the flesh they were judged. We have a group here um, uh, of angels that left their habitation, right? They despised dominion. They're going to be judged. And we see a group here that speak evil of dignitaries uh, going back to, um, you know, the, the wilderness, right? They're going to be judged. They're, they speak evil of dignities. So that, I think, um, if you read Second Peter, it's longer but he's doing the same thing where he's giving examples, and some of the examples are, are the exact same. He, he uses, um, I think, Sodom and Gomorrah as well. If you chart it out, um, what we have is kind of a condensed version in Jude of what we have in Second Peter. Um, the only example that's not the same, I think, is the um, maybe the group in, in the wilderness. But at least the Sodom and Gomorrah is the exact same example. Um, and we have almost that exact same verse, um, uh, verse eight is in second Peter where it talks about those, those three different sins. Um, so that's why I would say I wouldn't necessarily lump the angels in with the example with Noah. So do you hold to Heiser's view about fallen angels or watchers or any of those things in the Tower of Babel incident. I know it's a little bit unrelated, but it's very related yeah. to the question about the angels. I'm trying to wrap my head around what that is. That, are you talking about? The, okay. You're talking about that. Yeah. Heiser's view is that whenever the nations are dispersed, the sons of God um, he gets that from Genesis 32, verse De Deuteronomy 32. Right? De Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy sorry. 32. Yeah. yeah. Deuteronomy. So I, this I, this view is this view is the notion that during the Tower of Babel, then God gives over the nations to a bunch of these other angelic powers or sons of God, and that they are then set as the authorities over the table of nations which right. is like the 70 nations, that sort of notion. And right. so then later on, supposedly those sons of God ultimately kind of go bad and they decide to follow Satan as well. And so that would be a different fall uh, of the angels. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I write uh, an appendix on this in my book because like you said, it's not exactly 
the same topic, but it is related. Um, so no, I, I don't take that view. Um, and I, you know, since found that if you look at Deuteronomy 32, eight, like the King James says, when the most high divided, uh, to the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. But if you look at other, um, translations, it won't say children of Israel, it'll say sons of God. So it depends on whether the base text is using the Masoretic or whether it's using the Septuagint or the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls and Septuagint are going to say sons of God, where the Masoretic is going to say sons of Israel. Um, and so the argument there is that the sons of God is the correct the correct um, text, and then that is referring to angels. And then so those um, those seventy nations. Uh, were dispersed amongst 70 angels. And then we kind of have this view where every nation is worshiping their God that essentially uh, is an angel that was um, given in dominion or charge over that particular nation and fell and received worship for themselves. I do not follow that view. Um, I, I generally have a very low view of the Septuagint, mostly because um, there are portions in it that are very different in portions that are added, um, portions that are paraphrased. And we, we have a, a translation uh, prior to Pentecost that was done in Greek, where after Pentecost, we see languages going out um, to all the nations. So we, we, we see the Holy Spirit working um, sort of, in some cases, you can see paralleling, or you could say it's um, reversing, you know, what we see happening at uh, at the tower. But never in the Bible do you see 70, like a group of 70 angels, which is kind of the divine council view that Michael Heiser um, promotes. But you definitely see at the towers, 70 nations. And if you look at the sons of Israel, and you count up the group that went into um, Egypt, they were 70. And I think that what we have there is a picture that Israel represents the world. Um, and so when we see Israel going into Egypt and being enslaved, it's a picture of humanity being enslaved in sin and they're being lifted out. It's a picture of salvation. Um, later, in Deuteronomy 32, we actually have a, a verse that, so it's 3252 at the end of the, the chapter says, yet um, thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go hither unto the land uh, which I give the children of Israel. So we kind of have the same phrase referring very clearly to Israel. So I take it that that is not, I mean, if you look at like a concordance and you look at sons of Israel, it's a phrase that's repeated all throughout the, the Pentateuch or the Torah where um, sons of God is not. I think it more naturally is to be understood that we have 70 sons of Israel that are going um, into Egypt. And that is the the reference there. Um, and the proof text for sort of uh, that 70 representing the, the world and, and the nations um, would be booths, uh, the festival of booths, where we have 70 bulls that are sacrificed. I think that's a, a picture um, of the nations. That, that's what booths is a picture of, is in gathering of, of the nations. Um, or I, I don't I don't take it the view that we have, like, the judgment of of nations. Um, you know, we, we have... Well, go ahead. And that's, that's definitely where I, I definitely want to agree with the notion of the 70 nations is kind of representative of the whole world. You know, it's seven times 10. And so the notion of like 70 is this notion that the whole world is kind of under this control. And so the angelic view is the idea that there are these evil forces that kind of have control over all these nations and that, yeah, the festival of booths, these other types of ideas, they are, they're kind of we're all supposed to be kind of coming out from underneath slavery, out from underneath the world system, all those things for sure. Right mm -hmm. now here is where I struggle 
this, this is where things have turned a little bit for me. And this is where I'm struggling to kind of hold something much closer to the view that you have in your view. Is there any old Testament text that does refer to or talk about the fall of the angels? Or is it just completely off the page? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. When we get to the New Testament, we have this, we have demons. Um, and it's just kind of assumed that the reader knows what these demons are. Um, and, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, we see angels, um, like in Abraham's narrative, uh, that go and inspect Sodom and Gomorrah before its destruction, that take the appearance of man. Um, you know, I make arguments in my book, several arguments that just angels being able to to do um, what is said to be done uh, is not possible. Um, but no, I don't. I don't know if if we ever see. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that's taught in the New Testament that we have um, fallen angels. Um, right, right, and so that that's my struggle. So I'll just tell you, like, that's my struggle is that the only candidate places for fallen angels in the Old Testament, and I'm not saying this is like a foolproof argument, but the only places that I can think of are Genesis six and. Uh, Genesis 11, if you want to go there, you know, and it doesn't even have the fall detailed there in Genesis 11 for sure. Right. So when I look at these passages, I see this idea of a fall and kind of like what you're saying, like it, the reader is supposed to know for some reason, they're supposed to know somehow like, oh yeah, yeah. Peter's talking about the fallen angels. They fell sometime in the past. You know, Jude is saying, oh yeah. And the angels who didn't keep their own domain. And so it's like, well, like, well, where did it happen? Like, how do they know this? Because they don't explain. Jude, Jude doesn't go through a long explanation of what's going on and these eternal chains of darkness. He just kind of is like, oh, yeah, yeah, you guys know. And then he just kind of moves on. And yeah. Peter does as well. And so that's the part where I'm struggling the most is it also seems connected to this idea potentially of like the ascension of Christ, right? Which is the return of his authority, right? Reclaiming the earth for right. mankind. Talking about from so, Heiser's point of view. Well, I, I don't even think just Heiser, but so like when we talk about Christ's ascension, right? So like, let me give you an example. Uh, Ephesians 4 says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host yeah. of captives and he gave gifts to men, right? Yeah. Now this yeah. expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth. He who descended, he is himself. Also he who ascended far above all the heavens, right? And then it's just the idea that, right? Christ dies on the cross, he raises from the grave, and then ultimately he goes and sits at the right hand of the father, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's his supremacy. That's his rule and reign. And that is where we see this idea of Christ becoming the victor. And I feel like this is one of the reasons the Pharisees didn't really get, and most of us didn't really get, what is Christ doing? Like, why does he die on a cross? And it seems like part of what he's doing, right, is overcoming death, but he's overcoming the power of Satan, the dominion of Satan. Right. Mm -hmm. So there definitely seems to be some sort of spiritual aspect that takes place with all of that. Now, could I explain everything? No, probably not. But the main struggle I'm having is it's so obvious that there are demons in the new Testament. It's so obvious that there's fallen angels because of what these other texts say, where to place them and how to explain them. The only place, and this is the only reason I, I do hold out a little bit on this Genesis 6 notion. Rather, it is them actually coming down and procreating with women. I feel like it's justifiable to hold withhold judgment. But I do feel like there is some sort of fall of the angels. And maybe it's not that they created hybrid beings. 
maybe that's not the correct view and that you are correct about some of these other aspects. But I am struggling just on the fall of the angels point. Now it's yeah. it's clear they fall and God punishes them. But now I'm like, okay, where do demons come from? How did that happen? Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I did think of an example where we have um, God sent a, a demon to Saul. Um, and there's a, another example at the end of First Kings where we have a, a spirit that goes out and he's a lion spirit to all the, the prophets, uh, I think for Ahab. Um, but uh, yeah, I think what if I'm hearing you correctly, the angelic view explains where the angels fell. Because if if it's not in Genesis six, where is it? Um, and uh, you know that is one of those questions. I mean, if we go, so there's, you know, I think there's Genesis. Well, I guess this is again New Testament, but we have in uh, not Genesis, but um, Revelation twelve. You know, we're talking mm-hmm. about a a war in heaven. But I don't know if I would place that at. Uh, I don't think I would place that like as like the, the initial fall. Um, but you can even go back to the serpent or, or Satan. Um, and I think what we have here is, you know, you could place Satan's fall at, at the garden, right? Right then and there when he offers up, uh, Adam and Eve, um, the fruit, or it could have already taken place, right? You could also argue that Satan has already fallen at that point. Um, so again, yeah, maybe that, that gives a satisfying, uh, answer to, to the fall. I guess I'm comfortable just letting the, the, the Bible say what it says and not say what it says. Um, if, if the fall is at Genesis six, where is it? You know what I mean? Like, again, it's not there. Um, other than unless you're reading reading that into it, I I, I I I don't think I don't think you can actually just take Genesis six and just read that narrative and walk away being like, oh, boom, angels. You have to go over to that or Job and use that cross reference, and then you kind of a lot of people use that you know Book of Enoch as a crutch there. But I mean, there's really there's nothing about angels in Genesis 6. I mean, one of my big questions in the book is, if this is a result of the fall of the angels, why is the judgment on man? Because the flood is a judgment on man. It's very explicit about that. Yeah, no, and I think you're totally correct about that. And it actually gets into a very interesting question of how much responsibility do humans have when being possessed? Like, let's just imagine that, you know, you talk about somebody who's possessed in the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. To what degree are they punished for those things that happen? And I mean, I don't really know the answer to that question, but it's a really interesting philosophical question because hypothetically you could have the same notion of let's say angels come down and let's just say possess men. Let's, let's take a, let's take a hybrid view of Genesis six and let's say ages come down and they possess the tyrant Kings Mm -hmm. And that's their sin that maybe these tyrant Kings have these children outside of their own free will. And I'm not want to promote extra conspiracies on conspiracies, but, and then just ask a question like, okay, to what degree did those Kings have a part in that? Because the vast majority of the time, and I'm not going to say all of the time, because this is not, exactly my area of expertise, but most of the times that I've seen where demonic activity is really, really present, the person was a partial participator or a full participator. You know, if you follow any of the the cultish type of things, um, most of them do things that are participating in Satanism. They're doing a ritual. They're doing a sacrifice. They're doing something to invite the enemy in, in which case I think God is holding them responsible for then what happens afterwards. What do you think about that? I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, I would say Pharaoh would be an example of someone who, um, was hardened. Um, so I, I, I take that to mean that 
the Lord was using Pharaoh for his good purposes. Um, and, you know, I think we have Pharaoh that's clearly already hardened towards God's people, and he hardens them even further um, so that he's glorified um, as he plagues their gods, and and then his people go out and take their riches of Egypt with them. And and, dest and destroys uh, Pharaoh. So Saul would be, you know, kind of another example of someone. You know, we see the demon come. Um, it's sent to Saul. Um, after you know he's already had his kind of falls as well. Um, where the Lord has now moved on um, and given the kingdom over to David. So. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You're 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 bearing responsibility for your own actions, and that would involve even demonic uh, possession. Yeah, and so to address some of the other things you were mentioning, like one, I, I do, I I do believe Satan falls in the garden. Like that is his fall. The whole event is the beginning of his downfall. And then, yeah, Revelation 12, which is a verse that many, many appeal to, um, I don't think is a reference to angels at all. It's it's actually a reference to martyrs and the saints, and that's really what's being talked about there. So if you like eliminate Revelation 12 from the fall of the angels, that's where I'm saying I'm, I'm getting trapped a little bit because I'm going mm -hmm. like, okay, like where else can I put the fall of the angels? And like, for example if I believe that Satan falls in the garden, then postulating that the rest of the angels fall before Satan sounds even more weird and bizarre. So there's a bunch of these fallen angels and then Satan falls later just begins to uh, postulate these even other strange ideas. So that's where I'm getting a stuck a little bit for me personally. Now yeah. I do. Well, if I could I comment do, real quick yeah. Yeah, on that it. before you move on. You know, I would say that the Bible really is a, a story of God and, and humanity, and we kind of don't really have much on angels just in, in general. We kind of see they're very sparse in the Bible at all. The Bible is really concerned about humans more so than angels. So it really, I guess it wouldn't bother me that we don't get that sort of background with the angels because it's, it's um, you know, if we look at angels, they're they're said to be, servants to mankind they're to, to, to the lord they're they have a, a a serving role um and uh the, the kingdom is given over to you know jesus becomes a man right so and he saves humanity um and as a result the church um in, inherits um you know everything that is, that is given to christ and so i agree uh if you know if you're looking for for that, you're not going to find it. But I think what the angelic view does is it it kind of makes the Bible more about angels than it really actually is. Um, where, again, going back to your original questions, kind of where's the dangers, like this obsession over stuff that the Bible doesn't really speak about, um, which would be the fall of the angels, you know, we're only left to speculate there. That's, that's my view. I don't, I don't really see that happening in Genesis six or, or in the tower. Um, now, again, if you have this notion already set and you read it, you read into it, then again, you can kind of create this alternate story within. And for me personally, that was one of the attractive things about Michael Heiser is I got that secret sauce where it's like, Oh my gosh, now, now I'm understanding the Bible in a whole different way. There's this, all this, stuff going on underpinning that you know if you if you have the secret sauce and you understand this teaching then now you understand like there's these there's a narrative there's a separate narrative going on um within the narrative that involves the angels but really again i i would i would say we're really tracking humanity in the flood narrative in the conquest narrative in what jesus is doing in his ministry um you know of course there's a lot more of you know the spiritual um world we have in the new testament but you know i would i would just still i probably ran on for longer than i wanted to but i would just say i'm comfortable with just not having 
um, the fall of the angels anywhere in scripture. There's, there's a lot that we don't, don't know. And I think that's, it's okay. Yeah. And I really want to echo what you said is that the Bible is about humanity by and large, like that's, you know, it's about God, but it really doesn't say much about the angels. To give one example that I often bring up when I'm having discussions on Genesis one. So when did God create the angels? The Bible just doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't talk explicitly about his creation of the angels. That's because it's not focused on that. It's focused on mankind and our relationship with him. And I have always found it super fascinating that when we get to the new Testament, there are all these stories of demons because we have so little of that throughout the Old Testament. You know, I can't really think of any good examples where you're talking about much demonic possession. There's this little part where you have this evil spirit kind of bothering Saul. But other than that, we don't see David casting out demons left and right, or, you know, Elijah coming out and just rebuking spirits in the name of God or something. And so there is, there's a massive gap in our information and knowledge there. The only thing that we do see is that it's apparent that there are demons and there are fallen angels in the new Testament. And then it's kind of like, whoa, whoa. I don't remember reading much about that in the old Testament. What happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's definitely a very interesting and, and compelling point and, and space here. And so I, I think that it's, it's important that we allow a little bit of tension here. Would you agree with that? Because let me give you a different example where I had another guy and I argued with him and he wanted to argue that Satan isn't a real person, but rather he's just kind of the embodiment of bad or selfish desires or wickedness. But I have a hard time seeing or reading the Bible and going like Satan's not a person. He's not an active agent. Was Jesus just arguing with himself in the wilderness? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I hold to Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, the devil being, you know, a real entity, uh, you know, I don't know, in person being a being or, or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's not a force. Um, he's not a, an idea. Um, we see the same thing in Job where he's also interacting, talking, speaking as an individual yeah, definitely. I definitely feel like, well, I, I'm guessing then you do take that as being the malevolent angelic figure because many now they're taking the reference in Job as being one of God's divine counsel. He's not necessarily bad or evil or any of those things. And I just find that to be surprisingly lacking. I find this character to be entirely in line with the character we know as Satan from the new Testament, entirely in line with the, the, the serpent from Genesis three. And I'm just going like, please explain to me with good evidence why I shouldn't think of this as the one who opposes God. The yeah, fact that no, he's an I, accuser. Yeah, yeah. I think what we have is Satan there in Job for sure. So, cause I know you, you had to have done interviews on that subject too, right? Yeah. I do have an episode about, about Satan. Um, we get, again, we get a lot more in the new Testament than we do in the, on the old. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so much that we don't know. Yeah. It's pretty wild, but yeah, I, I definitely recommend your, um, resource and, and arguments here on Genesis six. Uh, the main struggle that I am having is exactly that, that tension. It's just like, well, yeah. And I, I think that you could say, kind of like you're articulating, the Bible just doesn't say much about angels. So why do I have to put the fall of angels anywhere? Especially, why do I have to put it in Genesis 6? Like, there's nothing that mandates you, I suppose, to force the fall of the angels to be in Genesis 6. Yeah. Um, that was one of the biggest things that drew me uh, out of it was looking at, um, I mean, just looking at it from, from both views. I mean, the Bible kind of explicitly mentions a, a, a judgment on mankind for their violence. Um, there's really nothing, there's no judgment of the angels there. And one of the arguments in my book is that it really makes no sense 
regardless of kind of what view you take on it, as far as the Nephilim after the flood, we have Nephilim after the flood. And so one of my big holes that I, that I would argue is that if this is somehow a judgment on the angels, how is it possible that we have angel that we have the same thing happening on the other side of the flood? It, it makes no sense. Any way you slice it, God's judgment is null and void. It's, it's like, it, it just makes no sense at all. Um, if somehow this is a means to stop the hybridization of, of humanity, if it just happens right on the other side of the flood, it's just, does, it just makes no sense. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the, the biggest issues I, uh, I take putting that into the flood narrative. Could you solve that with a local flood? And just say like, well, he killed some of them, but he didn't kill all of them. So right. in other words, yeah, like the other ones, they're further away. Maybe they hmm. got away. And, yeah. and I know that, you know, it just so, depends. Like, but some people hold to a more centralized flood. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the whole world in Noah's region. Yeah. I mean, you could kind of start, You that's one argument. Okay. And we have angels that sort of, or Nephilim that weren't judged, or they hopped up in, in, in spaceships. I've heard that before. Or <laughs> someone on the ark, usually Ham, uh, Ham's wife yeah. is carrying uh, the gene. But all of those, my main argument is it's a it's a failure on God's part to carry out the judgment. If it if there are angels escaping or you know Nephilim escaping the judgment, whether they're just not a part of the flood, they hop up in spaceships, or somehow the the gene is carried on. Um, the whole the whole point is is that God failed essentially to properly judge uh, what was going on. I mean. I, there's no way to slice it other to say that then the Nephilim got the better of God. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Because either way they're kind of avoiding the judgment. They're able to escape the, uh, the judgment. Yeah. Well, Hey, um, I've only got a little bit of time left, but I, I was curious, what is your end time persuasion now then if, that's kind of your next uh, big thing. So I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm going to be doing some uh, debates coming up. And so I will be arguing for amillennialism and I'll be arguing against the pre-mill view. Um, but I'm happy to argue against uh, probably post-mill as well. Well, less so than the pre-mill, but yeah. So where, where are you landing on this and where are you going next? Yeah, right on. Um, so uh, since we're kind of closing up, I will say that, we, we touched on a fraction. You did an awesome job of asking great questions, but um, the book is The Nephilim Myth. Um, and there's so much more that, we, that it, in the book. And I really appreciate it because I can tell that like you read the material and you asked me the questions that, that you personally had that were lingering for you, which tells me that this is something that you're wrestling with. You're actually doing the interview because you're trying to understand my my view and that is a trait of a really good interviewer and i really appreciate that you didn't come here with cookie cutter questions and just throwing stuff out that you feel like people might want to hear um that being said there, there's a lot of stuff that maybe like you're hung up on the new testament passages that we got a chance to talk about but maybe other people are hung up on something else that for example like book of enoch or whatever that um you know, we didn't even touch on tonight so you know if if you know you're tickled a little bit, you can get a, a copy of, of the book, uh, and, and check it out. Um, but I just want to further endorse it. Um, it was, it's a very well-written book. It's articulated very clearly. And yes, yeah, for those that are interested in the book of Enoch and thinking and reading all about that, um, he does a great job explaining a lot of the problems. The reason of course I didn't spend as much time on that is because I agree with you. You, you actually bring out a whole bunch of great problems concerning the book of Enoch, which you articulate very clearly. So if you're interested in the subject and interested in, Hey, what's the other view, then I highly recommend, yeah, pick up Delgado's book and yeah, but sorry to interrupt you. No, no, you're good. Um, yeah, I, I uh, really uh, appreciate you asking those questions because I can sympathize having come from that view there's always like that one kind of like yes but um in that one little thing and i could i could tell that um 
you're hung up. You, you know, when you say you're hung up on those verses, it's like until you can. And that's I think a lot of people are in that same spot. Um, someone else I shared this with it said the same thing and actually helped me add to the that the that portion I read to you about Jude to the book because it was like yes, but but what about Jude, right? Um, and so anyway, um, there's my little blanket promo for the book. I, I, I love talking about this. Um, and, uh, yeah, it makes me want to check out some, some of your, um, some of your podcasts. And I was excited when you reached out to me because I could tell that like myself, I often like to get people that have the opposite view and I may not change it today. And it's certainly the Nephilim was one of those things where there was like little, seeds that were planted along the way until one day I kind of felt myself just like, yeah, this is actually what I believe. This is the Seth I view. This is it, it finally one day it was, there was so much more stronger evidence towards the Seth I than there was towards the angelic that I had to be like, yeah, I can, I can say I, I'm now in this camp. But anyway, um, same thing. With well, and I want to add to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. One more thing I want to add that, so the other thing that I already had going into this, which is why I feel so much more sympathetic towards what it is you're expressing has to do with like the seed of the serpent, right? Cause some people think like, Oh, the seed of the serpent, maybe Satan slept with Eve, all this other mm -hmm. stuff too. And it gets exactly into these issues, but yeah. I find it to be very demonstrably true that the seed of the serpent is way more metaphorical and spiritual. Like when yeah. Jesus is calling the Pharisees, Oh, you're sons of the devil well, he's not really making some sort of biological claim. And so that's one of the reasons I, I completely agree with you going against these notions about this having to do with mixed blood, you know, and that's what it's really talking about. No, no, no. It's talking about spiritual issues. And as you've articulated, I think uh, again, well in the book, so much of this is about man's sin. It's about the spiritual issues. It's just not necessarily your point is it's not about the spiritual angel issues. It's about our spiritual issues. And so right. I really do appreciate that and really do take that into consideration. So I think you're doing a good job articulating that. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the, the, the positive feedback. Um, but uh, my end times view um, is I'm partial preterist um, and post post millennial uh, ist. Uh, and that was something that started the podcast was like really honestly just a lot of confusion. And I hopped over to that Amil camp after looking at Sam Storm's book, um, mm -hmm. Kingdom Come, something like that. Uh, but I had him on my on my program, and I originally thought I'm gonna drill him on these hard questions uh, that he's not gonna be able to answer. But after I read his book, I was like, mm, man, man, oh man, oh man, he, he just dissembled the, the, the pre mill. Uh, he, he did such a really good job in, in that, in that book of just dissembling the, the pre mill view. And I just thought, man, already had so many apprehensions with it, but he, he does a good job of just walking through the new Testament scriptures that, um, that dismantle that, uh, view. So I was kind of in that all mill camp, um, for, not long until I hopped over to, to post mill because the post mill is really technically they're both, they're both post because they both believe that Christ is coming after the millennium. Um, it's just the nature of uh, the kingdom age, you know, where one will take more of a pessimistic view or one obviously has a very optimistic view. Um, but uh, you know, one source for me that clicked um was James B. Jordan. He has a book called the a brief guide to the book of revelation. And it is brief, which is like my favorite. I, I try to write my book like that. Just like get to the point. Um, and he does exactly that. He gets to the point and walks through the whole book of revelation. Um, and, uh, you know, since looking at post, there's just so many, not even individual verses, but just pictures um, and yes, individual verses where we see uh, an optimistic view of the kingdom. And so that's when I kind of hopped over to the post mill view because I, same thing, I feel like I could argue that so much easier than say that the kingdom is just going to spiral, um, spiral out of control until Jesus comes and, and, and saves the day. Whereas, you know, I would see it happening as, as the opposite where we're making disciples of all nations. Um, and then once 
once the the world um, is is taken for the kingdom, then Christ hands it over to uh, his father. So, yep, that's my view. That is my view. Um, and I, another thing I'm super passionate about because I also felt like I was just lost in confusion for so long with end times, um, and specifically with, with Revelation. But what I found is with like the partial preterist view, it didn't only unlock Revelation, but like the entire New Testament. I actually was convinced from the preterist view, starting by looking at um, Jesus and his explicit um, prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem. I always thought that preterists like make a big fuss about that. Like it was a, a bigger deal than it really was. Like, yeah, we, I, I get it, right? The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, but y'all are acting like it's the end of the world or like it was, that's what the book of Revelation is about. And I, it, it seems bigger than that. Um, but it, you know, realizing um, that Jesus made these prophecies and then looking at all the epistles that refer to this coming judgment, it sort of, for me, one of the big questions um, was, were they wrong that the, the judgment was coming and it never did? Or you have to take that view where you take, you know, the verse in either first or second Peter that says that, you know, second Peter, um, a day is like a thousand years and, and a thousand years is like a, a day. And you just make it seem like, yeah, God's time's different. So they, it, we're just perpetually like waiting for Christ to come. Um, I just find it a lot more satisfying to say that, you know, they were really on, on the edge of the, the, the tearing down of the old covenant world and, and the, the new covenant coming um, in its fullness, the kingdom. And that, um, I feel like that's what the book of Revelation is about, um, that transition where we see Jerusalem falls and we have a new Jerusalem at, at the end. Um, so anyway, that, that's, that's my view. And uh, again, it, it just unlocked the whole New Testament for me um, and made the whole thing sort of like, oh my gosh, I, I get it. Um, this is what, this is, this is the, the big deal um, that we had the destruction of the temple and now we are, moving out to the, to the nations. Yeah. Well, you know what? We can still be friends, even though you're a post mill, <laughs> but we are Christians and forgiving and we'll let you back into the ah mill camp. If, anytime you want to come back. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah no, I mean, I, I, I find post mill to be pretty, pretty reasonable uh, by and large. I do think that there are some brands of it that I think are a little too far. Sure, but sure. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Um, but yeah, I, I still even so I I would say I have to lean more towards the the all male camp. So I'm very sympathetic to the, the, the all male because there's again there's we agree on so much. Um, there's again just almost just the nature of of the kingdom age is, is where mm -hmm. we would we would disagree, and there's a lot of all males that still have a very um optimistic, optimistic view, outlook yeah about about the about the kingdom age and the gospel going out to the nation so and i i agree you know there are some post mills that are like maybe pushing um versus a little too far and you know we kind of get with this dominion theology where they push that a little bit too far as well so um i can definitely see where um the post mill can can be misrepresented a, a lot as well you know i, I don't there's, there's always variances with, with any, with any of you as well. So, yeah. Yeah. A lot of variants and a lot of uh, change happening and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, it's been great having you, Sam. And uh, I'll be sure uh, if you want to find more out about Sam, I'll be sure to have any of his links and uh, hopefully a link for his book. If you want to pick up his book on the Seth I view, uh, it's really worth a read. It's, it's easy to read. It's easy to understand. It's not full of a bunch of, burden, labor, jargon, and the arguments are very straightforward. You won't be left going, what? You'll be like, okay, no, that makes sense. <laughs> so, and then I assume that he will also take other podcast invites in case somebody else is looking to, to hear more about the Sethite view. Yeah, so absolutely. what else do you have for our, our audience, Sam? Um, yeah, weird Christian podcast. That's my podcast. I'm not as active with it, but I you know if you're interested in end times, I, you know, there's a ton, um, 
on my channel uh, about that, my podcast. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much uh, for having me on. Um, I could, like I told you at the beginning of this interview, I could go for for hours on this subject. And um, so it is really great talking to you. Yeah, it's been great having you. So if you guys want to learn more, then hey, subscribe, share this, and go check out Sam Delgado. Thanks.